Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for joining. On today's episode, we're going to be looking at my portfolio, and I'm going to be going over my top five dividend-paying holdings. So out of my entire portfolio, which I own a number of companies, this isn't really concentrated portfolio, you know, it's a, it's a pretty broad one. Out of all these different companies, I have five that make up about half the total dividend income of my portfolio. So we're going to be going over those five holdings. I'll be going over each of them and I'll give you my outlook on them, whether I think they're currently a buy, a hold or a sell. We also, of course, have some news to get to, like what is going on with Disney? This is a company that I've been bullish on. And then we get news this week that they're laying off 28,000 employees. That's a lot of employees. This is specific to their parks. So I'm going to be looking at this news as well as some interviews with people that are giving their opinion on Disney and the current value of it, if it's valuable from an investment standpoint. So I'll be reacting to that. We also have an interview with Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin that I'd like to take a look at because he talks about the negotiations going on right now with the stimulus. So this is something that's been long awaited for everybody. They want another stimulus. It's something that will help the economy. And Steve Mnuchin says where that's at right now, what's going on with it. And if that does happen, what the outlook for the general economy looks like. So I think this would be worthwhile to take a look at. We also have, of course, we have to give an update of Nikola. This company has so much news come out every single day. Nikola has just continued to go downhill. It started off with that Nikola one truck in the bogus video. And the most recent developments is that the founder bought the truck designs from a third party in Croatia. These were the designs that he said in his own words that he, he developed in his basement. So they were actually purchased by somebody else and he made some tweaks to them. That's some news that we got over the past week. And then on top of that, with all the issues that Nicola's already facing, the founder, Trevor Milton, has two women that have formally filed sexual abuse charges against him. Even though this isn't confirmed right now, even though these are just allegations, it's not great for the company. It's not great for Trevor Milton. This has been disastrous all around. So we have a lot of fun stuff to get to. Now, before jumping into that, I have to give you a reminder that we do have a Patreon. It helps support the channel. It's $6 a month, cancel anytime. So there's no risk with it. You can try it out. It lets you have access to a Discord community of like-minded investors. Everybody's trying to make money here. So we share ideas, we share our buys and sells. I live stream stuff from time to time. So different events like the Tesla battery day, different things like that. So that's been a lot of fun. And then you also gain access to a dividend tracking website that we're building from scratch. So this has a lot of features. We keep adding to it. So this is something that you get as well, but you can try that out. There's a link in the description if you're interested. Okay, so let's jump right in. Let's first start off with the top five dividend paying stocks in my portfolio. Like I said, this is not the highest yielding stocks in my portfolio. These are the holdings I have that make up the biggest amount of income. So whatever ones make up the biggest amount of income, these are the top five in my portfolio. Together, these five make up literally half the income of my entire portfolio. So they're pretty big holdings that make up for a lot of income. Not all of them, I think, are, are really great buys right now. So I'm going to give a rating on them, whether I think they're a buy or whether they're just a hold, but we can go through all of them right now. And just a quick note, if you want to look through all the different holdings, aside from the ones that I highlight in every single episode in the description, there's a lot of different links, but one of them says, view my portfolio. If you click on that, it opens up this nice little thing from M1 Finance that you can go and click through all the different sectors and every single holding. So I can go and click through and see look, I have all these companies and consumer. So you can use that if you want. I update this link before every episode. Okay, so let's start off with number five. This is the fifth biggest paying dividend stock in my portfolio, and it's in healthcare. It's AbbVie. Now, AbbVie is a pharmaceutical company. Right now, it yields 5.31%. So this is a pretty high yielding company. The, the share price has been under pressure. It hasn't performed too great recently, but this is considered a real value buy. People that are buying AbbVie are buying it as a value stock. They believe that it's undervalued and that it will continue to go up. So that's kind of the, the thought process behind this. AbbVie is a company where a lot of its income is made up by one drug called Humira. In fact, a huge portion of their income, 60% of their gross income is made up from this one amazing drug. They grew this drug to be a huge product to treat a bunch of different things. If we look at what it treats, it treats everything from Crohn's disease to rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, these are, are very popular issues, very popular diseases that people have that this drug is a possible solution for. So this is AbbVie's big drug. The problem is they have a patent on it right now 
and that patent is expiring in a couple years. So have you looked at this and said, well, we're not going to instantly go to zero revenue once this patent expires, but it is going to bring it down because people will start making generics and that will mean that we have competition. So we won't get as many customers or we won't be able to charge as much for the drug Humira. So after a couple of years, when Humira patent expires, Avi is going to lose a lot of its revenue that it's been enjoying. That's what investors are fearful of right now. So what Avi did was they grew the way that healthcare companies grow. All these pharmaceutical companies basically grow by acquiring other companies. So Johnson & Johnson will acquire smaller pharmaceutical companies that make some drug. That's basically how all of them grow. Some of them do in-house testing and research and development, but a lot of their growth is acquisitions. So Avi looked at their situation. They said, we need to diversify our product line. We need to make it so we're not so dependent on Humira. And they purchased Allergan. Allergan is the maker of Botox products, which are very much known for their cosmetic applications. A lot of women get Botox to make it look like they appear younger, right? It takes out the, the stress and wrinkles in their face and stuff and makes them look younger. That's what Botox is known for. A lot of people don't know that Botox is used medically without cosmetic applications all the time. So doctors and surgeons will use it all the time to treat things like migraines, um, as well as other like nerve issues in the, in the face. I don't know all the details of it, but I do know that Botox is used in non-cosmetic ways very frequently. So Allergan is a, a company that has Botox as a huge product line in its company. Avi had Humira, and now they've joined forces together under Avi. So that's the company. It's more diversified right now. It has a lot of debt, but it also has an enormous amount of cash flow. So all those things together mean that it's most likely able to keep its dividend. If they cut their dividend, it would just be based off of management deciding that would be the best thing to do if they saw a better opportunity than paying out a dividend. But right now they can continue to cover their dividend. I currently own 41.6 shares of AbbVie, which means that I make $196 a year or about $49 every three months from this one holding. So I get paid about 50 bucks every three months from this holding, which is pretty good. So this company does provide a constant stream of what I think is a mostly reliable stream of income. The reason why I have not put more money into this company, the reason why I only have $3,600 in it in a portfolio that's worth about $120,000 is because it's healthcare. And that's just not my area of competence. I don't work in healthcare. I'm not super familiar with pharmaceutical companies. I don't have a tremendous amount of interest in learning all the details about them. And so what I do is I limit my exposure to them. I only have $12,000 in a portfolio that's worth $120,000 in healthcare altogether. In AbbVie, I have $3,600 in it. So I'm not going to invest a whole lot of money into any pharmaceutical company because I'm trying to follow my own rules of investing more heavily into companies that I feel more competent in. But everything that I've read, all the research I've done, shows that AbbVie is probably an undervalued company right now. So that makes up AbbVie. That's number five, $196 a year from this company. And number four, we have a real estate holding. It is Realty Income Corp. This is number four biggest dividend paying company in my portfolio. Right now, Realty Income Corp has a yield of 4.5%. That's pretty low, but it's high in terms of their historical dividend payment because Realty Income Corp, even though it's a REIT, it's a pretty high quality one. And so people pay up for this company. They, they will buy it if it drops down below certain metrics. A lot of buyers are waiting to get in on Realty Income Corp. And so a 4.5% dividend yield is actually pretty decent. That's a pretty decent starting yield. I currently have about 75 shares, which means that I earn $210 every year from this company. It pays monthly, so it's paying me $17.50 a month. Most dividend investors know about Realty Income Corp. It is a boring company. It's a real estate company that leases out to investor grade tenants. Most of them are recession resistant. They're like Walgreens or 7-Eleven. These companies that can really survive through a lot of different rough environments. So Realty Income Corp is considered a pretty safe holding even in the coronavirus era, even with the threats we face right now. So this is a company I'm fine holding right now. I actually would consider a buy. I think it's pretty decent value right now. The biggest risks with Realty Income Corp, just like any other real estate company, is definitely another lockdown, another coronavirus resurgence where everything gets shut down and brick and mortar stores get, get hurt. So that would be the biggest risk for this company. I think that that's somewhat unlikely to happen 
You might consider me naive, but I don't think that we're going to have another lockdown to the same extent we had initially. But that is number four, Realty Income Corp that pays me $210 a year with my $4,500 holding. And number three, the third biggest dividend paying company in my portfolio is in finance. It's a big bank. It's a very big bank called JP Morgan. JP Morgan Chase is the largest bank in the US. It's ran by a legendary CEO named Jamie Dimon. It's been moving heavily into the digital sphere. So it knows there's a lot of fintech competitors and JP Morgan is trying to take that on by offering a lot of digital solutions. So this company's trying to compete with all these fintechs while especially trying to balance all the issues it has with the economy going on right now. As you can imagine, during these type of events, when we have the coronavirus, when we have a global pandemic and a recession, a lot of people look at banks and they go, no, thank you. I don't want anything to do with banks. And the reason that they do that is because we all have a memory of 2009. Things were really bad for banks. Most of them got completely wiped out. And so investors want nothing to do with it. The difference is, is that banks have tremendous amount of reserves that they did not have in 2009. Jamie Dimon calls this a fortress balance sheet. They have made reserves of tens of billions of dollars in preparation for, quote, all eventualities. Basically, Jamie Dimon, he's a very conservative person with the way that he operates JP Morgan. If you actually go back and look in 2009, JP Morgan did fine in 2009. They actually didn't take on enough severe losses to make it so that they lost book value. And he's prepared to do the same in 2020. So I think that JP Morgan will come out of this recession pretty unscathed. I think that they've put together enough reserves to really prepare for all eventualities, even if the coronavirus is far worse and far more damaging than we anticipate. If that's the case, if they can come out of this unscathed, we should see a nice cyclical play where this bank goes up in value as the economy recovers. They usually follow the economy. If the bank doesn't have to destroy book value and sell its really core holdings and, and assets at depressed valuations, they should make for a pretty good return moving forward. This is a company that likes to do a lot of share buybacks and likes to do a lot of dividend payments. They will do both of them when regulators say, we're no longer preventing you from doing share buybacks and we're no longer preventing you from raising your dividends. So when that happens, I think that JP Morgan will have capital appreciation and I think it will have dividend increases over the next five or six years. But even in the meantime, while I wait for this story to play out, and while hopefully we get past the, the loan losses that will occur with these banks and they can recover from it, JP Morgan's paying me dividends every single quarter. I own 62 shares, which means I get paid $225 a year or roughly $56 every three months. So I'm enjoying that income while I'm waiting patiently for this story to play out. And number two, my second biggest dividend paying company in my portfolio this is a company every single dividend investor knows about. A lot has been said about this company. It's AT&T. This is the very high yielding telecom company that has for about a decade been, been a pretty disappointing stock for investors. Just to give you some, some context of how disappointing the performance of AT&T has been, let me throw something up on the screen here. This is AT&T versus the S&P 500. The blue line is the S&P 500, which is just the general market, and then AT&T is that black line there, with dividends reinvested. So this is the total return with dividends reinvested. AT&T since 2015 has returned 14.25%. With dividends also reinvested, the S&P 500 has returned 79%. 79% for the general market compared to 14% for AT&T. So this company has been a disappointing investment for five to 10 years now. And I believe that this is a direct result from the decisions that management has made. In 2015, the management of AT&T decided to buy DirecTV. This was the peak of linear pay television. Management did not see the obvious decline of pay television, and they spent a fortune to buy DirecTV at the worst possible time. This was when Netflix was starting to take off, and other streaming services were really starting to gain steam was in 2015. So management made possibly the worst acquisition of the past decade in 2015. And now they're looking to sell DirecTV for about half the value. 
So instead of selling it for about $50 billion, they're trying to get maybe 20 to 25 billion. And even then they're struggling to find buyers for it. So this has been a complete disaster. That's $30 billion thrown down the drain over the past five years. That's pretty incredible to lose that much money, not to mention all the time and energy and money it takes to negotiate these deals and try to integrate this, this asset into your company. So the unaccounted for expenses make this even a bigger loss. So we know that AT&T is a company that's been marred by terrible management decisions over the past decade, and that's resulted in substantial lost opportunity for investors. But as investors, we don't look at the previous performance of a company. We look at the future performance. We're here to see the future and what's going to happen with these companies. What's the story with them? AT&T has had its bad decisions, but it has some things going for it. One of them was the excitement over HBO Max. They were combining all of the content they have into one service called HBO Max, and they're trying to get this on every different streaming services. The problem is HBO Max has not been taking off like Disney+. Plus. It's really been pretty stagnant. It has 36.3 million subscribers, which most of them were from previously just HBO. So not much has happened since HBO Max. In fact, we can see here that since the last data, July 23rd, HBO Max has only gained 5% of new subscribers since 2019. So they've only gained a little bit of subscribers since the start of 2020. This is coronavirus. This is the age of streaming video, and HBO Max isn't doing that well. They have some issues. They're like the only streaming service that is not on Roku, so hopefully they can negotiate a deal with Roku. But even so, their big growth driver, which is HBO Max, is not doing well. So I look at AT AT&T and I think, should I just sell this company? It's not been doing well over the past decade. The streaming service has potential, but it doesn't look way promising right now, like Disney+. Plus. What should I do? And I I look at it, and there's one thing that sticks out to me with AT&T, and it's a P-E ratio of 17. It's trading at such a low multiple in today's market that I cannot justify selling it. I have to hang on to this company as long as it's trading at this low of values. So I do not plan on selling AT&T. I don't plan on really adding more to it right now. I plan on holding it and enjoying the dividends that it has and hoping that management can change the story around because I can't imagine the P.E. ratio falling too much further unless there's really bad news or something really bad comes out of AT&T. Now, I own 196 shares of AT&T, which means that I get $408 in dividends every single year. Based off their current dividend payment, that gives me about $102 every quarter. Now, number one, the number one biggest dividend paying company in my portfolio by far is Store Capital. That's in real estate. It is this one right here, my top holding Store Capital. Store Capital, I like for a variety of reasons. One of them is they have a very unique business model where they focus on not renting out to investor grade tenants. Investor grade tenants are companies like Home Depot, Walgreens, 7 Eleven, these companies that are really well known that they can for sure pay their bills. Well, the issue with renting out to companies like that is because they have an investment grade, they have a lot of leverage when they're negotiating the contracts and their leases. They say, we don't want to show you how much money we're making on a per store basis. So you can't see how much money they're making. They say, we don't want to have this high interest rate. So we're going to rent from you at a much lower cost. So you don't make as much money with them. And they also can say, we're not going to have master leases. Store capital avoids all those issues by renting out to middle market companies. So instead of Home Depot, they rent out to Ashley Furniture which is kind of a well-known company, but it doesn't have that investment grade rating. And because they do that, they can form a much stronger contract with those companies. And they can see on a per store basis how much money those companies are making. So the unique business model of store capital allows them to make a lot of money from the companies they're renting out to. Now, they have some other things that I like as well. One of them is the CEO. Christopher Volk is the executive running this company. He's very transparent, and I think he's very forthcoming. He writes in-depth articles on Seeking Alpha, giving updates on what their plans are, what their business model is, how the company stands right now, how much money he has invested into the company. I just think that he's an extremely transparent executive. Now, on top of that, I think he's very competent. So he's not only forthcoming, but I think he knows how to run this business very well. So he's good at looking at risk. He's good at looking at losses and gains and 
weighing a, a risk-adjusted return. So I very much like Christopher Volk running this company. And from all the available data we have from Store Capital, things are moving in a positive direction. They are collecting more and more rent every single month. Their rent collection, as last reported, is 88% on a contractual basis. That's an improvement over the previous months. And they mentioned that no new tenants have requested lease deferrals in September. So they're not getting any new requests for deferrals. They're collecting more and more rent every month. And they just raised their dividend. I would consider store capital a buy. I've been buying personally a lot of the company over the past couple months. I have $12,000 of it, so it's one of my biggest positions in my portfolio. I now own 442 shares. It pays 35 cents per share per quarter, which means I earn $619 every year in dividends from this company. So about $154 per quarter just from store capital. So this is my biggest dividend paying company. I like owning it. I think it has a pretty bright future. One warning on this company, like REITs in today's environment, it's very volatile. So if you're investing in store capital, you're going to see big swings every single day, plus 4%, minus 3%, plus 5%. Get used to those type of swings if you're going to invest in individual companies, especially REITs. Unlike, of course, any other REIT, it's very susceptible to the economy. So if we have another big shutdown, more coronavirus, more companies going out of business, store capital is going to have a difficult time dealing with that. It is somewhat reliant on the economy gradually opening back up. So keep that in mind if you're investing in it. But based off of what I know and the data available, I think this company's a buy. Okay, well, that was my top five dividend paying companies in my portfolio. Altogether, those five make up about $1,700 a year, which is about half the total yearly income of this portfolio. So they're five pretty important holdings in terms of my dividend income. Now, let's go ahead and move on to some news. Okay, the first news item I want to go over is Disney just announced that they're laying off 28,000 employees as the coronavirus slams its theme park business. Now, a lot of people look at this and they're upset at Disney for laying off these employees. I think that's a misdirection of where where your, you know, your anger should be at news like this. Disney employs these employees based off the assumption that they're going to be working in these parks. California and other states have made harsh requirements on the parks that they can only open with certain capacity limits, and in some cases they can't open at all. So Disney is constrained by the governments that regulate their parks. They can't operate their businesses as normal. And meanwhile, they're paying for a lot of employees to still have benefits when their parks aren't open. They're still paying all these benefits out. So Disney's looking at this and they're saying, we tried to hang on to these employees. We want to have them as part of our business. We want to open back up, but we simply can't. All the regulations, all the rules keep us from opening back up. The coronavirus is something that is a constant strain on our business. And until we get a clear sight of when we can open back up, we have to let them go. So I think that's a situation that Disney's being put in. I think that their hand is being forced by both the coronavirus and local governments and the restrictions that they have. Now, in an interview with CNBC, Bernie McTernan from Rosenblatt, who he follows Disney, this is one of the companies that he follows and he gives his outlook on, he explains why investors are investing in Disney right now. What is the biggest hurdle, I, I guess is the best way to put it, that Disney as a company will face in the coming weeks, what can they do to get investors back on the bullish side of this particular trade? Well, I think that we've been one. The reason why you own Disney is is because of streaming and because of their content. And really, there's so much uncertainty in all of media, whether at the, whether that be parks and studios and people going back to theaters, um, even on the advertising side. The one thing that is working for media companies is streaming. And really, with Disney Plus, we're looking for um, an announcement with their Star Plus platform going um, outside of the U.S. sometime, maybe this year or early next year. And we think that that's going to get investors to talk about where the next hundred million subscribers for Disney is going to come from on the streaming side. So, and that would, you know, right now they're at close to a hundred million, um, and Netflix is at two hundred million. So they'll be, you know, I think narrowing that gap over time, and increasingly we'll be, you know talking more and more and more about the profits and revenue of this company coming from streaming um, and not and not parks. He is 100% correct. I've been saying this for a long time, that investors are focusing on the parks and resorts business of Disney, and that is not the thing that they should be focused on. A lot of 
investors right now, they look at streaming and they look at the bottom line. Oh, it's not even making any money for them. They're giving out lots of free trials. It's really not a significant part of their business. The streaming is the big part of their business. That is the growth driver. The people saying that it's not that profitable or it's not affecting the bottom line that much right now, that's the same thing that telecom companies said with Netflix when it was first starting off. They did not recognize the subscription business model and the power that that has when you gain more and more customers. Disney has shown that they can execute getting a lot of streaming customers. They can execute that very well. The management has done an unprecedented push into streaming with their marketing. They have gained 60 million subscribers in less than nine months. I think by the end of this year, like he said, they'll be reaching close to 100 million subscribers. And the conversation will shift for Disney. The conversation earlier was, well, Disney is a parks and resort business. It's being hurt by the coronavirus. It's not really talked about too much with their streaming. Later on, that's going to be the only thing investors talk about. Once it hits 100, 150 million, 200 million subscribers, they're not going to care about the parks and resort business. They're going to look at the streaming. So I think that he is 100% spot on with this. The reason people own this stock is because of the streaming. We're not really concerned about the parks and resort business in the short term. That's very short term looking and short term thinking. If you're looking at the long term for Disney, is that they'll be one of the dominant players in a huge market, which is video streaming. Now, like I said before, Disney here is trying to explain they don't want to be blamed for laying off these 28,000 employees. They'd like to keep them employed, but they have to have their parks open and the local governments, like in California, are not letting them open back up their parks, even though Disney's saying we could do that safely. We could open our parks and we have lots of different methods and routines to sanitize and to separate people. We could do it very safely, but the local governments are not letting us do that. They're laying a lot of this responsibility at the feet of lawmakers and regulators in California for not letting them reopen and do business the way that they want to do it. How do you react to that as an analyst that covers this kind of company? Um, again, it comes back to me saying, you know, thinking about what, what's going to be going on with the numbers. And as I said before, that we expect them to get back to prior levels of profitability um, over a multi-year period. We modeled it coming back on the top line, but frankly, it seems like it, it might be a combination of, you know, the top line and cost cutting. What's interesting is that it seems like the park business could be changing. I mean, your parent company, Comcast, they, they had plans to open up uh, or start construction on another major gate in Orlando and has completely paused um, on that plan just because it's uncertain kind of what the next generation of parks should look like. Um, and maybe it's less people and tickets cost more and you have less people working there. Maybe that's how this ends up. So he just says maybe they have to transform their, their experience at the parks. Maybe they have less people in the parks at a time. They have less employees you pay a little bit more because you don't have to wait in line and it's a more enjoyable experience without having to be packed. But you you transform the way that you're running these parks. That's basically what he's saying. Until lawmakers decide to open things back up to where they were before, Disney has to transform its business. And part of doing that is not having so many employees. If there's not as many customers, they don't need as many employees. And I will say that I do agree with him that in terms of the park business, I don't think anybody's expecting Disney to start earning what they were at least a couple years out. I think it will take a while for them to get back the same level of profitability that they had previous to the coronavirus. So I would not be surprised if that took two to three years. All in all, Disney is a highly contested stock. It's one that has a lot of disagreement on the valuation it deserves. There's users like this that commented on the CNBC video that said Disney should be $67 or lower. So they're saying the price should go down a lot. Rick Byrne says without the cruise ships running and the parks being closed, it's a $50 stock. The dividend will be cut next. Apparently, he doesn't know the dividend has already been suspended. He also says, now the reason you own Disney is because it's become a movie channel. That's it. This is the type of disagreement you get with this company. And that is exactly what you want when you're initially investing in a company. If there was universal agreement with how much Disney will be worth because of its streaming domination, then there would be no value to be had. Everybody would value it the same, the price would go up, and you would not get a great value at it. The fact that it's highly contested right now shows that if this thesis does play out, if investors do start to value Disney based off a growing, dominating streaming platform, then you have more value to be had right now. 
The disagreement is good for you. It brings the stock price down in the meantime, so you can enter a position and enjoy the growth in the years to come if your thesis is right. So my thesis is the valuation of Disney is very much misunderstood. And once they start growing their streaming service to hundreds of millions of people, investors will take a different look at it and re-rate the company. I think that it will enjoy a higher multiple once that happens. Now, moving on, I want to jump to this interview from Steve Mnuchin, who's the Treasury Secretary. He's asked about a couple different broad questions, and one of them is how he sees the future outlook of the coronavirus, specifically with vaccines. Does he think this is going to help? When does he see these coming out? And he gives a little bit of a hint of a timeline here. Well, I've I've been listening to the medical professionals, and uh, again, I take great comfort in the progress that's being made on vaccines. I think it's pretty clear we're going to have a vaccine. What the exact date is, we'll see. It could be soon. It could be the end of the year. But uh, I I think that the money that we've invested in vaccines, vaccine development, manufacturing is really going to pay off. So he gives a little bit of a timeline there. He says that he for sure thinks we're going to have a vaccine. That's one thing. He thinks we're going to have one. And he says it could be by the end of 2020. So that's when we could initially see a vaccine for the coronavirus. Now, in another part of this interview, he's asked about getting another stimulus package, whether that's going to happen before the elections. Here's his response to it. Well, I say we're going to give it one more serious try to get this done. And I think we're hopeful that we can get something done. I think there's a reasonable compromise here, Um, something that the president very much wants to get done and make sure that we help those parts of the economy that still need need help. So we're going to try to see if we can get something passed. So there's no guarantees. He says that they're going to try to work things out. They want to get something passed before the elections, but they still have to come to an agreement. He said that he was hopeful. That's the word that he used. Hopeful the White House and Democrats could strike a coronavirus stimulus deal. So this seems like there's a chance we could get another stimulus. I think that most likely we will get something, but I don't know what that would be. And right now there's really no guarantees with it. Now, the last bit of news I want to go over was Amazon released a bunch of new products, one of them being Luna, which is Amazon's cloud gaming service, where it's easy to play great games on devices that you already own. No waiting for lengthy downloads or updates. So this is Amazon's attempt into cloud gaming. I personally do not see this as being anywhere as successful as what Xbox is doing. I think that Microsoft will win this cloud gaming because they're coming out with the devices that can run games for serious gamers that I think drive the engagement to games. The Twitch streaming, all the engagement that goes along with gaming. The serious gamers are going to use powerful machines to play their games. Luna, I think, will appeal to very casual gamers. And I don't think that that's going to drive the market decisions, not the big AAA developers, as well as the massive audience of games. So if I'm deciding between Amazon and Microsoft based off their cloud gaming, I think Microsoft is clearly going to come out on top on this. But Amazon didn't end there. Like they do sometimes, they came out with a ton of products, like a bunch of new ones. And I will say one thing about this. I don't know if I'm the only one who thought this when Amazon was showing all their new products. They seem a little creepy to me. Some of them seem a little bit creepy. If we look at this one, the Amazon Echo Show 10, it seems innocent. It's just like the Google Home Hub or any other little, uh, you know, iPad-like device. But then you look at the trailer of it, and the thing swivels and follows you around as you're walking in your room. Did you get it? Did you get it? Believe me, you gonna love it. Alexa, show me cupcake recipes from Food Network. Uh, look at the look at the camera following her around. I don't know if it's just me, but that strikes me as a little bit creepy having a screen that just slowly swivels as the camera follows you around the room. I don't know if people are really going to sense that when they're being tracked by cameras now. Not just knowing that this thing has a mic and it can listen to you all the time. Now it has a camera feed that will track you around the room. Maybe if you're just on a call, but it seems like it will do it all the time. So the screen is always facing you. A little bit creepy if you ask me. And on top of that, we already know that they announced the Halo Health Band. And again, this is something that on the surface seems kind of innocent. It's going to help you be healthy. Then it does some things like it takes 3D models of your body and uploads it to the cloud so it can do analysis on your body fat. It listens to your tone as you speak to other people and tells you what your tone is like. So the device, again, can be listening to you, analyzing your speech 24-7. Um, And then, of course, it has a bunch of other information about your health. 
And then on top of all of that, Amazon owns Ring, which announced that same day that they're going to have a flying security drone that flies around your home with a video camera. Here's some of the ad for this. Okay, there's the burglar breaking into the house and then this drone just launches out of its little pod there. Okay, so we we have cameras that track you around the home. We have wristbands that listen to everything you say. Now we have drones flying around your house monitoring for burglars. This is the world that we live in. Am I the only one that thinks that this is a little invasive? I'm a I, I'm technically in the millennial era, right? I, I grew up on the internet. I grew up dealing with these type of devices. But there's just something about seeing a drone fly around your house that's controlled by these big companies that's a little odd. It just seems a little odd. And then, of course, they announced a bunch of different products like their mesh Wi-Fi from Eero, I think, E-E-R-O. So that's their mesh Wi-Fi system that Amazon is now an owner of. So that's basically it. Amazon can now know what you say every single day, how your speech is, what your body mass index is with your body fat percentage, what websites you visit, and they can have devices all throughout your home that can listen to anything you say, as well as video cameras that can literally track you around your home or just fly through your house as a drone. This seems to be the new world that we live in. The amount of data that Amazon has is pretty incredible when you really think about how much they can gather from this. But according to Amazon, they want to protect your privacy. Alexa and Echo devices are designed to protect your privacy. So you heard it there first from Amazon. They care deeply about your privacy. They don't want to invade that at all. Okay, well, that's going to be all for this episode. I appreciate everybody for tuning in. If you could throw me a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't, I would appreciate that. Apparently, it helps out the mythical YouTube algorithm. So I appreciate everybody that does that, and I'll talk to you guys in the next episode.